Coming up on this Wednesday edition of Newsline at Noon, South Korean Cardinal Andrew Yom Sejong visits the Inter-Korean Industrial Park in North Korea. Sparking speculation, Pope Francis will also travel to the north during his visit to South Korea in August. With two weeks remaining before the June 4th local elections, the government's poor handling of the Sewol Ho ferry disaster has given opposition candidates a boost in the polls, particularly in and around Seoul. Plus, a twin bomb attack in Nigeria kills more than 100 people. The Islamist militant group Boko Haram is the prime suspect. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. It's noon Wednesday, May 21st here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in live from Seoul. I'm Oh jin -ju. Very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this lunchtime, South Korean Cardinal Andrew Yom Su jong made history on Wednesday morning, becoming the first Korean Roman Catholic leader to cross the inter-Korean border into the north. And with Pope Francis scheduled to come to Seoul in August, expectations are high as to whether he will become the first pope to visit North Korea. Hajang News' Hwang Seung Hee reports. Cardinal Andrew Yam Su Jung became the first Korean Roman Catholic leader to ever cross the inter Korean border on Wednesday. His day trip to the Kaesong Industrial Complex comes amid escalating tensions on the peninsula. Although the South Korean government says the visit is in no way political. The objective of the visit is to tour the joint factory zone and to meet with South Korean Catholics. There are no politically motivated meetings scheduled. It hasn't been confirmed whether Cardinal Yam will hold mass at the Kaesong complex, but he has in the past been vocal about his desire to do so. He had planned to hold mass at the joint industrial park last December. But that plan was scrapped at the last minute following the execution of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's uncle Chang Sung-tek. North Korea claims its people enjoy the right to religious freedom, but authorities are known to crack down on religious activity, deeming it a challenge to the leadership. The cardinal's trip comes three months before Pope Francis is scheduled to arrive in South Korea for a visit, fueling speculation that the Holy Father could also make a stop in the north. Pope Francis, who has shown a great deal of interest in peace and reconciliation between the two Koreas, is expected to deliver a message for the entire Korean peninsula when he visits Seoul in August. For now, the attention is on whether Cardinal Yam's trip will contribute to thawing inter-Korean relations. Hwang sang Arirang News. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's push to restore his nation's right to collective self-defense or to come to the aid of an ally under attack has certainly gotten the attention of neighboring countries, including Korea. Tokyo says the change is necessary to defend itself, but others really aren't as sure. And experts are wondering aloud what the fallout may end up being. Our Kim Hyun bin reports. The opinions in Japan's push to restore its right to collective self-defense are varied and strong. A senior researcher in the United States weighing in on the latest developments says South Korea, Japan and the United States need to hold trilateral talks on the matter, particularly regarding the range of influence Tokyo could have on the Korean peninsula after the right to collective self-defense takes effect. Larry Nish of the Congressional Research Service said South Korea is undoubtedly against Japan's push. And the key issue was determining how much is Washington willing to compromise with Seoul on the matter. Even inside Japan, there is resistance. The Japanese daily Asahi Shimbun conducted a public opinion poll last month on Prime Minister Abe's push to extend the role of Japan's self-defense forces. 63% of Japanese people polled were against the move, just 29% were for it, leaving questions about whether Abe will be able to move the public and politicians. Mindy Kotler, the director of the U.S.-based research center Asia Policy Point, said Abe is seeking to reinterpret Japan's pacifist constitution too hastily. She pointed out that the administration is not fit to handle the task, as they have been unable or unwilling so far to resolve historical differences with neighboring countries. That said, 
Most sources within Washington say Japan's call to self-defense reform will strengthen the nation's alliance with the U.S. and in turn enhance security on the Korean Peninsula. Bruce Klingner, a senior research fellow for Northeast Asia at the Heritage Foundation, says without Japan's support, it will be impossible to defend Seoul in the event of an armed clash between the two Koreas. He added that it is imperative to bolster defenses to counter threats from Pyongyang and Beijing. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Russian President Vladimir Putin and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping have pledged to forge closer bilateral ties amid the festering tensions with the United States. The leaders met in Shanghai on Tuesday on the opening day of joint military drills that are likely to draw disapproval from Seoul as they overlap with South Korea's recently expanded air defense identification zone. Shin Se-min reports. Meeting in Shanghai Tuesday, Presidents Xi and Putin agreed to strengthen their economic and military ties. They also held in-depth talk about North Korea's nuclear and missile programs. Praising the tightening military ties between the two sides, President Putin said he was convinced Moscow and Beijing could forge a strong strategic partnership and that bilateral military cooperation was developing very well. Putin's visit to China coincided with the beginning of the two countries' joint naval exercises, Joint Sea 2014. The drills have raised red flags in Seoul as they overlap with South Korea's expanded air defense identification zone. Neither Moscow or Beijing notified the South Korean government prior to its announcement. It's the first time an international military exercise has taken place within Korean waters since the expansion of the air defense zone last December. On the business front, the two leaders failed to narrow their differences on a natural gas supply agreement worth of 400 billion U.S. dollars. A 30-year contract between the Russian state-controlled fuel supplier and Chinese National Petroleum Cooperation was left unsigned, as both sides couldn't agree on a price at which Russia would supply gas. Moscow wants to find new buyers for its gas outside of Europe. This is because U.S. allies in Europe have imposed sanctions against Moscow for its annexation of Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula. In regards to the security situation on the Korean Peninsula, both sides said they were concerned about North Korea's nuclear program and the simmering political and military tensions between the two Koreas. China and Russia stressed the long-stalled six-party talks on North Korea's denuclearization are the only effective way of reaching a deal everyone is happy with. They called on all parties to do more to secure peace and stability in the region. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. And moving on to some economic news, the Korean government will spend an additional 7.6 billion U.S. dollars by the end of next month to help boost domestic demand hit by last month's Teodo ferry sinking. At a policy meeting with the ruling Senate Party Wednesday, Finance Minister Hyuno Suk said that the move is part of government efforts to make sure the recovery of the domestic economy won't be derailed by the disaster. He added the government is also considering tax breaks and other financial support for the travel industry and domestic-oriented sectors that were in particularly badly affected by the tragedy. The positive outlook for the Korean economy is picking up speed, with Korean shares hitting their highest levels in more than five months, despite the strength of the local currency. The cost be climbed to 2015 on Monday, its highest level so far this year on the back of increased exports, a gradual recovery of the U.S. economy and China's growth policies. Korea's top five brokerage firms forecast the country's benchmark cost be to trade in the 2100 to 2400 range throughout the rest of the year. It comes amid the Korean won appreciating nearly 4% against the greenback this month from the first three months of the year. Local analysts, however, say the trend could be affected by an end to bond buying programs in the U.S. this fall, as that may bring about a hike in Korea's interest rate. And starting July, Korean consumers will be able to use their online identification PIN number in the offline world. The Ministry of Security and Public Administration says it will introduce a new way of confirming a person's identity using so-called IPIN numbers instead of resident registration numbers, which are the equivalent of social security numbers in the U.S. 
The government's move comes on the heels of a revised bill regarding personal data protection that prohibits the collection and exploitation of resident registration numbers from August. The government came under intense fire earlier this year for the country's biggest ever personal data leak. And time now for a look through the international headlines for falling this hour. And for that, we check in with Eunice Kim standing by for us at the News Center. Yes, Eunice, more violence in Nigeria. This time, twin bomb attacks in a central city have killed scores of people. Indeed, and the Islamist militant group Boko Haram yet again is being blamed for the blasts, the latest in a series of sustained attacks that's leaving the African country reeling. Yudian reports. All right, we'll move on uh, to our next item there. Thailand's interim government has proposed a new date for its general elections. August 3rd, after its election commission last week said it was logistically impossible to hold elections by the previously set July deadline. Thailand's caretaker prime minister said he will meet with the electoral body today to finalize a date as early as next week. He also promised to speak with the country's army chief as soon as possible to end the political turmoil that has killed 28 people and injured some 700 since protests began November last year. Thailand is under military rule after martial law was declared throughout the land early morning Tuesday. And moving on to China, it has warned the United States of jeopardizing military relations by naming and charging five Chinese officers with hacking and cyber spying. Beijing's foreign ministry demanded Washington withdraw the indictment, returning the jabs by accusing the U.S. of hypocrisy and double standards. The foreign ministry also summoned U.S. Ambassador to China Max Baucus to lodge a formal complaint as Beijing suspended a joint cybersecurity task force with Washington. Earlier, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder had explained the unprecedented indictment as an aggressive response against state-sponsored economic espionage that harvested trade secrets to the detriment of U.S. Uh, US companies. <clears throat> And we apologize for that technical difficulty we had earlier. We'll go ahead and take a look at the uh, at Yudian's package, or rather story, on Nigeria. Two car bombs exploded in Nigeria's central city of Jos on Tuesday, killing at least 118 local civilians. One ripped through the center of a busy market. Another half an hour later, outside a nearby hospital, killing some rescue workers. A local official says the death toll could rise further as rescue teams continue to recover bodies from the smoldering debris. It's not yet clear who's responsible for the attack, but Boko Haram is the prime suspect. The militant group has been carrying out a series of bomb attacks across the center of Nigeria, trying to overthrow the government and create an Islamic state. If Boko Haram is to blame, Tuesday's double bomb blast would make it their deadliest single attack in five years. President Goodluck Jonathan issued a statement late Tuesday expressing sympathy for the victims and reassuring the public that the government remains committed to winning the war against terror. Terrorism in Nigeria has been under the international spotlight ever since Boko Haram kidnapped more than 200 schoolgirls back in mid-April. The girls who remain unaccounted for are reportedly being threatened to be auctioned off to become wives of militants. The campaign to get those girls back continues in Nigeria. There is hope. There is a lot of hope. We believe the girls are safe. We believe the girls are alive. And we believe with the tremendous support the Nigerian military is getting, we believe that the girls will be rescued and returned home. But fear is rising. As evident by this latest attack, Boko Haram is becoming increasingly vicious in their campaign for an Islamic state. More than 1,000 people are believed to have been killed by the militant group this year. Yudian, Arirang News. 
And finally, Libya's election commission said the country will push forward with parliamentary elections on June 25th. This amid fears that the country could be spiraling into civil war. A standoff had riddled the country's parliament. Tripoli has accused General Khalifa Haftar of planning to topple the government after his supporters attacked the parliamentary building on Sunday and his so-called Libyan National Army had called for its suspension. Haftar has denied the charge. The elections would be the first since the ouster of Muammar Gaddafi back in 2011. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. Connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah Jin Ju. President Park Geun-hye returned home earlier today following her trip to the UAE, but she won't have any time to rest. The president has no official schedule for the next couple of days, but she is expected to start the process of identifying a new prime minister and reshuffling her cabinet. Hwang Jae has the details. When President Park apologized this week for the government's poor response to the ferry disaster, she chose not to mention her plans to shake up the cabinet. But as she told the families of the victims late last week, follow-up measures to the accident, including a reshuffle, are expected to speed up in the coming days. Pundits are carefully looking at who will be the president's candidate for prime minister with the current prime minister, Chung Ung Wan, set to resign to take responsibility for the government's lax response to the ferry disaster. They say the appointment of a new prime minister will mark the starting point of the cabinet shakeup. Speculation is rife that the nomination of a new prime minister could come as early as this week, as it's already been almost a month since Tong offered to step down. Those held most responsible for the poor handling of the disaster, the ministers of oceans and fisheries, public administration and education are most likely to face the chop, but there are growing calls for a clean sweep. Ruling and opposition party lawmakers are demanding the entire cabinet as well as senior officials at the presidential office step down. Pundits say President Park's new government lineup will affect how the public evaluates the sincerity of her apology and will play a key role in whether she wins back public sentiment. Huang Jie, Arirang News. Just two weeks remain until Koreans head to the polls for the June 4th local elections. Recent polls suggest voters living in key regions are warming to the main opposition party. Analysts say this could spell a big election day victory for the new Politics Alliance for Democracy, which was formed a mere two months ago. Our correspondent Ji myung reports on how last month's ferry disaster has given the momentum to the opposition party. The effect of the government's poor handling of this Hyoto ferry disaster is being reflected in recent polling, which shows that the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy is gaining support in Seoul, Incheon, and Gyeonggi-do province. According to a poll conducted this week by TNS Korea of more than 14,000 likely voters, the ruling Senator Party's candidate for Seoul mayor, Jung Mong Jun, is more than 15 points behind incumbent mayor Park Won Soon, who was at 51 percent support. It's a similar story in the city of Incheon, where the ruling party mayoral candidate Yoo jong Bok is trailing incumbent Song Young-gil of the opposition party by more than 10 percentage points. The race for governor of Gyeonggi-do province is much tighter. Just 0.9 percentage points separates Henry candidate Nam Kyung-pil and opposition candidate Kim Jin-pyo in the TNS Korea polling. All three local races are considered significant on the national stage, as the three areas boast about half of Korea's total population. Earning victories in these races can give a party a full head of steam heading into future legislative and presidential elections. In other important local races, such as in the conservative stronghold city of Busan and in the liberal stronghold city of Gwangju, the polling fell more along party lines. 
According to a survey conducted by the National Election Commission last week, 55.8 percent of respondents said they will vote on election day, up one percentage point from the 2010 local elections. Campaigning is set to begin on Thursday, and public safety has emerged as a hot button issue in light of April's ferry disaster. Kim Young Gil, Adirang News. Now, on a very different note, glaciers in the Antarctic are melting at, an, at irreversible rates, according to scientists, and that means serious trouble for life as we know it. A recent warning from a non profit organization in the U.S. says Americans should enjoy their historical landmarks while they still can, as many may be unrecognizable or completely submerged by the turn of the next century. Our Sun Jung In has more. Rising sea levels, the erosion of coastal areas, increased instances of flooding, heavy rain and more frequent wildfires, all are damaging archaeological resources, historic buildings and cultural landscapes across the United States. This was the warning issued by the nonprofit organization, the Union of Concerned Scientists, as it highlighted 30 historic American landmarks that are under serious threat from climate change. They include the Statue of Liberty, which the group says is at serious risk if sea levels rise one meter by the year 2100, as scientists predict. Jamestown, the first permanent English colony in Virginia, is also forecast to be completely inundated by the end of the century, while the Kennedy Space Center in Florida is also threatened. NASA had earlier said glaciers in the Antarctic are melting at an irreversible speed and forecast that the city of New York would be underwater within 200 years. We passed the point of no return in this sector. And at this point, we'll say it's just a matter of time before these glaciers completely disappear to sea. In the western U.S., rising temperatures have led to an increase in wildfires, which are getting more severe and less predictable posing a major threat to both human beings and wildlife. Some experts warn that this is merely the tip of the iceberg and that the human race should act quickly before it is too late. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Okay, well, on a much, much lighter note, for those of you watching who have already tied the knot, today is Married Couples Day here in Korea. Recent data shows the state of marital union in the country is stronger than it was just a decade ago, with more couples staying together for the long haul. Our Connie Kim takes a look at why. May is the most popular month to get married in Korea, and also the month it celebrates Married Couples Day. To celebrate the union of marriage, the National Association of Mayors at the National Assembly has been hosting an annual ceremony for the past few years. At this year's event, Yoon ha won and Lee myung won were named this year's Married Couple of the Year. I thank my wife for supporting me during our 51 years of marriage. This day was established by the Korean government in 2007 as a way to get people thinking about their marriage and, more importantly, their spouse. Married Couples Day falls on May 21st for a reason. With the numbers 2 and 1 symbolizing the union of two people, it's a day to remind couples of the importance of a happy marriage. More Korean couples are staying happily married these days. The nation's divorce rate peaked in 2003, which experts attribute to the spillover effect from the Asian financial crisis, but the number has been on a gradual decline ever since. Analysts say couples are also putting more thought before saying, I do. Statistics Korea data shows that the average age men and women get married has gone up by more than two years in the past decade. On average, men now get married at 32 and women at 30. Experts also say that couples are now openly discussing their problems more than they used to, which makes for healthier and longer-lasting relationships. With the society becoming more open, couples are visiting counselors, and efforts made by such institutions have started to play its role, giving couples a chance to think about staying together. According to the married couple of the year, the secret to a long and happy marriage seems to lie on one simple principle. Married couples fight because one doesn't think about the other person's situations. Sacrifice is also important to maintain a happy marriage. Connie Kim, Arirang News.
Well, according to East Asian calendar, today is Soman when farmers start to plant rice, meaning summer is starting to set in. Uh, but it actually feels like summer is already in full swing, and today should be no exception. And it's quite sunny right now, and it should get even sunnier as the day goes on. So we are expecting high UV levels in most areas, which means it's a good idea to protect yourself from the sun. Well, a partly sunny day is in store over in Chindo. The winds and waves will be a bit calmer compared to yesterday, and the currents in the water should remain slow. With that, here are the readings for today. The high in Seoul will rise to 27, while Daegu peaks at 30, and Busan should climb to 27. Now, for other regions, down on Jeju and Daejeon will reach 23 and 27, while Mount Gyeonggang tops out at 16. Well, that's all for me today, but I'll be back with more updates tomorrow morning. Thank you, Jian. And those are the stories we're following at this hour. Yes, Jinju and I will be back at the same time tomorrow. Thank you for watching.